Hello, I'd like to welcome you to today's Woodstock Masters Dialogue between artist Nancy Azara and Sarah Lynn Henry on Thursday, January 14th, 2021. I'm Doug Shear, lead of the Birdcliff Forum of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild in Woodstock, New York. Comments of our two speakers are their own and do not necessarily represent those of Birdcliff. If you wish to make comments or ask questions uh, about 40 minutes into the, uh, to the process, uh, you can do so at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a chat function uh, and the interviewer will select some of those questions or comments uh, for Nancy. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Lynn Henry, who will introduce and interview Nancy Azara. Yeah. For 25 years, Dr. Henry was director and professor of the Drew New York sem semester on contemporary art. This program had as its central focus, studio conversations with major artists in New York City, as well as monthly trolling of galleries and museums plus an on-campus art critical historical seminar. In a sense, it was art from the street up. In the process, Dr. Henry facilitated discussions with over 300 artists, including Alice Neal, Eric Fischel, Alex Katz, Joan Snyder, Keith Herring, Julie Heffernan, Peter Halley, and Judy Pfaff. Dr. Henry. Well, I'd, I'd add to that too, that um, I was a professor at Drew for 30 years. Um, and then when I, while I was there and then afterwards, I uh, took to curating exhibitions and doing some art writing. And so I curated uh, two exhibitions at the Kleinert, uh, one called The Animals Look Back at Us and the other one recently, Labyrinths of the Mind. And so I'll reference that in talking about uh, Nancy's work. Um, one of the other big ones that I did was I Am the Cosmos, which was at the New Jersey State Museum in Trenton. So that's just to say I've been looking and thinking um, and exploring and reading and talking to artists um, and sometimes even living with them. So <laughs> through my life, um, I wanted to introduce then Nancy because very interesting. I, when I moved full-time to Woodstock in 07, I had a friend and it was Judy Russell actually. So you've got to meet Nancy, you've got to meet Nancy. And uh, so I finally went when she and then Darla Bjork uh, did a panel at WAM it was on the New York Feminist Art Institute. Um, and she and Darla and Miriam Shapiro were founders of it. Um, the New York Feminist Art Institute we'll talk about was from 1979 to 1990. Now, so they're showing work of the students. And as professor, I taught this contemporary, you know, I taught the history of contemporary art right up to the present. And I knew about what went on in LA and then I was very interested in the feminist movement, um, but I knew that uh, Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro was out there then, uh, did a very well-known exhibition called Woman House in a 17 room Victorian house and had the various uh, students in their feminist art program, um, do take a room, like, oh, I'm going to take a kitchen. What am I going to do with the kitchen? I'm going to take the linen closet. And the two I remembered were rather bald, punch in the face, feminist messages. You know, one was in the kitchen, there were fried eggs on the ceiling that became breasts coming down, right? And in the linen closet was a naked mannequin cut into pieces, each fitting in a shelf. Like, you know, I'm imprisoned in the linen closet. And it, it you know, they carried good messages. What interested me about uh, what Nancy was showing um, and talking about was that the work was uh, very different. It was much more subtle and moving, much more depth 
um, and seem to be forms of a new personal consciousness. Um, and I would, I, I just going by my memory of going to that, that they seem quasi abstract, somewhat pictorial, symbolic, searching a stream of art making. And that they were really just exploring a deeper source of art, as does Nancy in her own artwork. So this is part of what we're going to get at in what's been a, a very rich, longer exchange for me with Nancy over the last uh, 10, 12 years. Um, now, her trajectory is part of my introduction, introduction here, finds itself in three overlapping arenas. Um, first, uh, with, and then these are not mutually exclusive, they've nurtured each other. But as the founder and teacher and has been an ongoing mentor of new women's art for 30 years, um, and now working with multi-generational dialogues as well. Second, you know, we're gonna talk about all of these things. She was, has been an, the instigator of a, what I think of as a revelatory uh, workshop mode of discovery for a non-artist, for a young artist, for a practiced artist. And I have attended, what, three, I think, of Nancy's workshops with this because I'm amateur artist and I'm really an art historian and writer. And uh, this, allows the participant to find their own personal insight and forms. And that's what I was seeing on that panel. Third is Nancy as artist herself. So these three arenas to explore and some of her background, you know, where this all comes from can come out of our dialogue. You know, she and I've talked about some of this ahead. So let's first, let me ask a few questions and then Nancy, feel free to interject at any time too with something you would like to talk about that I'm not quite hitting. Now, the New York Feminist Art Institute founded in 1979, how did that come about and what was it, its objective? Well, its objective, uh, I, I guess we could deal with that first, was <clears throat> to really to explore what was in the air, which was that women artists feminist artists and feminists who are all looking for a, a, an understanding of what our vision was, is. And some of us thought, well, women really have a different point of view and will make different statements. Once we have a, a, a forum for expressing ourselves in a way that's truly, naturally, authentically ours. And there's been a lot of work done nowadays too with the discussion of the kind of the imitation, uh, uh, the, the kind of manner in which women have to um, perform and behave in order to find acceptance and to really live, be able to live in the world. And so this was the beginning, the seed of that was about 1970. Uh, where we all yeah. got together and it was a West Coast group and an East Coast group. And there were plenty of uh, women artists and women in between. Um, <clears throat> there was uh, women in Minnesota, women in Chicago. When you start to really uh, look at this more deeply in, in its um, the kind of power it had, it was uh, exciting to see how many women were, women artists were, were translating their vision into uh, a personal form, because personal was not permitted in, a, in an art school situation before. A personal was very put down and demeaned. <clears throat> and women did personal things. I mean, you do something for yourself. A therapy was something you did for yourself. <clears throat> so that was personal and it was diminished. Uh, so we were about to find out and to look into what that meant. Um, many of the women, so we started in 1979 with Miriam Shapiro, who had moved to New York and came from a woman house and a group of, I think it was six total. 
And we started to explore what that meant and how would we ever find out what our, what our real authentic forms were because um, so much of it was men teaching in the art schools and women students. The proportion was way off. There were so many women st art students. Yeah. And they were mostly all men in the studio departments. Mm -hmm. there, were, <clears throat> there were a few women who were um, art historians, art critics, but most of it was um, already like an established form. Uh, men were the teachers and women were the students. And when I was in art school, it was, um, um, no one was embarrassed to say I'd make a very good wife to a good artist. I mean, that was a common uh, way that you would talk to women and it was supposed to be a compliment. You didn't find it was a compliment. You didn't have a sense of humor, which is something that uh, uh, would require a whole lot of discussion, but how humor is used to politically oppress people is something I'm very interested in. And that was the case in those days. So uh, we all just sort of found each other. It was so exciting to find all these other women that were thinking similar ideas and other women artists that were exploring women poets uh, it was it was so exciting. Most of us would go to consciousness raising meetings, and then we'd go home, and then we'd be on the phone for hours with our with our friends and our members of the meeting to have conversations about um, what it was we talked about. So this became the source for um, a beginning to form a feminist art institute, and. Um, it was different than, than uh, California, however, in the fact that we were not so engaged with doing things in a group. I mean, we did have Judy Chicago come and we did do a weekend of the birth project that she was working on at the time. And um, the dinner party was opening at the Brooklyn Museum around that time. So Judy Chicago came for two days and uh, we did all kinds of exercises and different uh, performances for and with her. And um, we began to de develop art out of that and that was a group effort. As far as I was concerned, I was brought up always to say things like, we did, we thought, we said, even though it was just me who thought and said it, it was part of a form that uh, was just something that women did in the, in the um, 60s and 70s, 1960s, 1970s. So I prefer to really try to work more singularly. And mm -hmm. most of the New York artists felt the same way. They didn't really want to be, do group efforts as much. I mean, I'm not against a group effort and eventually I developed um, a, a workshop where we did consciousness raising and we drew and made art out of that. So that I, my idea was to set that up so we could look for our original forms because they just weren't happening in the way um, that had to do with eliminating the voice of your teacher, which said, this works or this doesn't work. That's a very common uh, way of looking at art uh, that's still used. And I, I began to wonder, it works for what? And what is it trying to say? What does work, this works mean? And what kind of formula does it come from? And often I, I realized that the formula it came from was the artist who was, say, in love with a particular artist like Picasso or Pollock, right. who was trying to get you to work in that, with that formula. And of course, there's some merit in that. <clears throat> when I was in art school, I studied with Edwin Dickinson. And he always wanted students in his workshop to work the way he said. And he'd always say, and that was really always is, is exactly how he would phrase it, that when you're with in my workshop, you work the way I want you to work. When you leave, you make a decision and you work it however you like. Mm -hmm. So that was a given uh, when you studied with him. And um, 
Anyway, so there were all these things came together and a whole group of us decided to uh, get together and make a feminist art institute happen. Great. Judy, uh, if, Judy Kerman, if you would put up the, that first image of the book of, of oh. uh, Nancy's teachings, I'd be grateful. Go back to the first back. one. Yeah. Keep going. There. Yes. And then also, yeah. Okay. So I wanted to, to have us have images while we talk now. Yes, okay. um, Nancy, would you say that what this this was uh, published, what, 2002, I think? I 2002, it. it's still, That's people true. are still buying it. And yes, people yes. Are still, um, I still get messages and notes and I'll go to a party and meet someone and we have a chat and they say, oh, I, I picked up your book or... I read your book a couple of years ago and sometimes I refer to it. And I, I'm kind of thrilled because it, that was my intention. And you never know when you make art or when you do right. something like a book like this, that it will, you hope that it will have a life to it, but this continues to have that kind of life. So I'm kind of exciting. So um, would you say that uh, some of the fruits of your teaching at the Feminist Art Institute are exemplified in this workshop mode that's in this book um, and well, the workshops that some of us have taken with you. The first half of the book, I talk about my life, my relationship to art and my observations about art and the way to look at art, the way I look at art. And I also discuss how the New Feminist Art Institute came together. And then the second half, I, I have a meditations. Yeah. Was from the consciousness raising um, in the workshops, I began to feel that we, we could even get deeper if we did meditations, guided meditations and made art from that. And that's what I started to do in the spirit taking form, making a spiritual practice of making art. I love that title uh, because this art really has and offers itself an opportunity to be a spiritual practice. And if you choose to open yourself to that, there's a lot of very fine riches for each person who works with that and a lot of discoveries. So that second half of the book is meditations that I used in different classes and workshops throughout the country. And, I, and in Europe, I did teach in Italy and I taught also in Wales and London. So, um, so, and all throughout the United States. And it was always interesting to me to find that um, the uh, different qualities of the art that people make had a slightly different look to it from, um, from each of those people. So each one is different. Yes. yes. And that's what's interesting. I was in a workshop, uh, the ones I remember, one had to do with a room and another with a pathway. And I would describe very briefly the room and that was we would envision a room and it was to be our creative room. I'm going a little bit from the book as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we see what the door looks like. We open the door, we go in, you know, we're sitting there in a, a, a meditation and what, we could also call a visualization and then you see what's in the room what it's made of and there there are windows all of a sudden and then you look out and you see what's coming through the windows uh, you can even see who might come into the room now i would just say from the personal standpoint all of a sudden i saw all this nature these vines and this garden and these trees and out the windows. And I realized that had something to do with what I was going to do inside the room. All right, so it's that kind of logic that occurs. Um, so what in the workshop we would do is have the visualization and make a drawing and then talk about that drawing and show it. And then there would be an additional piece we could do and make another drawing and then talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I found it, it quite profound um, I, I, in the union sense, had been told, uh, okay, visualize a room, put yourself into it, and over a number of years, you can see how it changes. 
and to show the power of imagination with this, uh, you know, personally, the first time I put this together, I was hiding under a table in that room, you know, and I'm like 50 years old and teaching and slowly came out, sat languidly on a Victorian couch. And then all of a sudden, a few years later, my room had windows and a skylight. Mm -hmm. We're not things invited or thought of. So what I'm saying is that Nancy's method can elicit so much personal content. Um, so I would ask then, what do we mean by the term spirit? I just want to take that up. Um, Nancy and I talked about that. That word has been over the last 30 years not, uh, not considered was is considered to be bypassed that you know the postmodern view is that we deconstruct terms we look at the cultural construction of meaning for instance you see that changes in the language that it's a historian you're you talk about he did this he did that and you mean he or she but now it's particularized or you say people did not not all not all these so what what does spirit mean for you, Nancy? And then uh, well, spirit, I guess, to me means something eternal that's within all of us mm -hmm. and not something you can touch or pull out. Um, but I think it's something that speaks to you and is there for you. And I think definitely it's in, it's in art making or it gets, becomes manifest in art making. And so you can really, um, almost have that tactile quality when you're making art or when you finish the work, because you can look at the work then with a perspective and say, um, or sense that this, the idea of spirit was in there because it's so intangible and spirit is. Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting term because as many levels, one is the kind of transpersonal or something larger that's inside of you, that's particularized inside of you. The Germans use the term Geist, and they mean uh, imagination and mind and intelligence. You know, we talk about the spirit of the age. Um, and I think it it plays both those roles in the kind of teaching and in, in your work. Um, let's get Judy to take us to the next image. I should mention, though, yes, that, go ahead. The, that the cover is, is a piece called Changes. Yes, and they are made over a series of years and they're interchangeable so that they work either individually or together. Um, sometimes there are like 50 of them all hung together and sometimes three or four work together beautifully. So I had one, I wanted to share that before we went on. So. Oh, good. And I had meant to do that. And, and in terms of what some of those motifs are, we'll get to that in looking at because I want to plunge into your work next. Okay. So this is called Spirit House of the Mother. Right. Um, it was done by Nancy in 1994. It's something you can walk into. It's 10 mm -hmm. feet high and seven feet deep. And I would say this is a sort of room. And so yeah. I would ask her, you know, talk about this. Uh, what, uh, why the mother, why... Uh, a house that you walk into, mm -hmm. why these colors? Well, the, the idea of the spirit house of the mother is that we're giving a credence to the female divine. Um, in this piece, in particular, that's what I'm doing. And I think that we were trying to do that as collectively, individually, but collectively, early on in the women's movement because it's always him. He does, the God is always a male, uh, even though uh, we've been able to now do historical studies on the Holy Ghost being the Holy Spirit yeah. and often being connected to the female. That was not the case when we first started to do this. So the idea of a female, infinite female within the self you see, the problem is if you're always talking about a male God, you're always looking at the outside of you if you're female. If you're male, it's a perfect fit. So uh, the attempt to restore mm -hmm. that original divinity to, to women, to ourselves, was uh, working on these pieces. 
was really looking toward that direction. So. Right, you've chosen the gold leaf. You know, why mm -hmm. with the gold? Um, and then, uh, Judy, give us the next image. Oh, yeah, the next is more of a, yes, the next is another view from another side. The side in the front. Right. And when you come to this piece and you approach it, it's quite masterful. I mean, it's the idea is that it's 10 feet high and it puts you in a kind of um, position to reflect in a different way than you would if it was more diminutive or more your own size. I've worked a lot with sculpture that's um, si human size. And I think that has a great deal of value, but the whole idea of the divinity was something I wanted to make larger. And the idea of the reflection of the self. Oh, that's it. Ah, I should tell people because people are asking, this is, these are all carved wood. All of this work is carved wood. And it's um, from planks. If you see, if you look closely, you'll see all these one by 12 lumber planks. Sometimes I work with very old wood, but in this piece, I think most of it is lumber. And it's, it's 24, 22 carat or 24 carat gold leaf. And the whole piece has got that, is gold leaf on the outside. And in the inside is a magenta color. And when you shine light around it, um, it's quite beautiful. And also people enter it and there are spirals on the floor, which you can walk around, or if you take your shoes off, go in and stand on it. And They'd feel good. Actually. Yeah, they go. And a gold leaf for me is like sunlight also. It's like the, the radiance gold leaf, of sunlight. It has a radiance that both seems to reflect as well as to have its own inner light. Yes. And you were saying, interesting, that we have our own reflections in a sense with it. Okay, let's go to the next work, uh, Judy. There we go. And this is called Birth Picture. And it's in here to show us a very early, we have two very early by Nancy and then several others. Uh, it's 1967. Right, when my daughter was born, this was um, uh, an image that I carved from a very large piece of maple. And I find it fascinating because in a way, it reminds me of Raoul Hogg whose work I hardly knew of at the time when I made it, and who actually lived in Woodstock. So I felt that there was a sort of a kindred spirit in it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I find in all of your work, two things. One is that you use the natural materials. Right. Um, and it's as though you can touch and feel them. Mm -hmm. um, and second, that the works are an experience rather than a a uh, statement in, in terms of a simple uh, message or sign. Right, uh, there's a narrative in them in some way. Yeah, and so we can go through this whole piece as if we were holding it. Let's right. go to the next one, because I, I want to bring us to the full array of what we want to do. This is also okay. early. It's called right. Widow's Tongues. Right. It's 1973. Right. Uh, this is also different from your uh, more characteristic work in some ways that you developed later, but natural materials and an experience. Why was it, why was it widows and what are the tongues? Excuse well, widow's you. tongues is a plant. Oh, and, really? okay. uh, yeah. And um, it just struck me, there was a kind of story about that doing consciousness raising and trying to re, all of us, and trying to re-establish a sense of self that had to be found because I felt it had been not honored within me. The 1950s was mm -hmm. not the best time to grow up or 1960s. Well, the 1960s wasn't so bad. It was the 1940s and 50s, really. Oh, yeah. And, um, so the widow's tongues, the plant itself is almost indestructible and quite beautiful and green, sort of a spotted green. And the piece, the wood carving, that's the, that's the second layer, the top layer, has the kind of spikiness that the widow, widow's tongue plant has. 
They also call it sometimes the snake plant. I often chuckle when I talk about this piece, or used to chuckle even more, because there is a mother-in-law plant too. And if you take a bite out of it, you can't speak. Now, I, I've never had any, I've never met anybody who's taken a bite out of it or done any real study, and I would like to sometime, maybe. Um, but, um, uh, but so the whole mythology around house plants and the fact that women talked a lot and probably were talking in ways uh, that they were, were kind of sinewy and spiky and snake-like. Mm -hmm. uh, I think to me was a part of the message that I was receiving um, in the folklore about these plants or this mm -hmm. plant in particular. It seems to have a great uh, kind of almost stream of consciousness in three dimensions sculpturally yeah. and that there's this and this is being said and this is going on and that's going on, which I love. Yeah. And one could also play with what are the emotions coming out? I'm, I'm just gonna pose some questions. Judy, give us the next one. We have in detail of this. Okay. Judy, there you go. Just to show a close up, you've, mm -hmm. you've used more than one piece of wood that you've put together, right? Oh yes, the bottom yeah. part is walnut. The bottom, the central bottom part is walnut. So that's why it's so dark. And I think the top might be maple or ash. I, mean, I don't remember now. And uh, there's some oak in it. This, form here on the on the on the right is oak and there's several anyway so it's a mix of different woods and that I felt enhanced it at the end, wow, I paint the piece works so that I get something similar to this but at that time I was just beginning to experiment with painting the work and um, the different woods helped enhance that idea yeah, let's go to the next one because we'll come with, this is called Heart Wall, mm -hmm. and we see we're moving into a large piece that comes out of the Spirit Outs of the Mother modality with the gold, with uh, different motifs, um, and I think of this as a journey that one might take from one end of it to another. Um, was there a special location or circumstance that prompted this? Uh, well, I was um, very engaged in Buddhism at the time. I still am, mm -hmm. um, but much more directly. And this piece is about 20 uh, to uh, 22 feet long. It's really room size. Yeah, uh -huh. and it's been shown actually in a lobby on Madison Avenue and 44th Street. Oh. for almost a year so and people loved it because it was so different than a nice clean steel building so they had a feeling uh that they, they were more nice. connected it was more connected to themselves uh than generally how they went to work every day and i liked that part a lot so it's a it's a bit of a journey through what you'd call the heart chakra yeah, yes. The hard energy. So the, the, next, the next one, which has a, a really vivid public presence, um, it's called the Hand oh, yeah. Garden, the Doctor's Wall, 2004, commissioned right. piece uh, for a hospital in Hamilton, New Jersey. And, and this is one of the ones that kind of knocked my socks off, having been rolled around in a hospital or walking around in one these days we get older we're there and then you wow you look at a wall it's different than looking at you know a big photograph of a lake or something yes definitely yeah and, had a couple of lake photographs up before but they took them down but yeah as usual and they wanted this piece to be in honor of the doctor's hands the healing hands of the doctor so I went in, um, and they gave, and they had the head doctors of each department. It was at the Robert Wood Johnson Hospital in Hamilton, New Jersey. And we traced the hands. And my friend who's a physician, a woman physician did the tracing. So we kind of chuckled at that. Since they were all male doctors that they presented and I snuck our hands in there too. So we'd have a little <laughs> uh, <laughs> of the other gender in here um, and they did say that it was changing I said how come they're all male doctors here 
And uh, they said, well, that's changing because a lot of these doctors have daughters now and they're becoming doctors. Oh, that's interesting. And these two women, one was the director of the hospital and one was the director of the foundation for the hospital. So there were a lot of women engaged and involved in the hospital, but in terms of the doctors, the head doctors were all male. So there's a woman doctor in there, lots of hands there somewhere, different places. And I put my hand in too, so the artist's hand is in there also. Oh, good. Yeah, and if they wouldn't let me say to the doctors where their hands were. They wouldn't let me identify them because they said they would fight over it. Okay, so I didn't. And then at the opening of reception for this, uh, when it was unveiled, uh, they, uh, the doctors did spend a lot of time putting their hands up and trying to figure out whose hands were whose. At the very end on the left, you'll see, this is a real installation. It's about another, I guess, four or six feet wide and about, um, I guess it's almost eight feet high. So you get a sense of, so as you go through, as you wheeled in, uh, because a lot of times people came out of the operating room and they were wheeled through this uh, mural uh, forms, uh, relief sculptures, and they would see this and they would be kind of surprised. I mean, I imagine now, since the pieces have been installed for quite a while, that they, people may not have that feeling of surprise. Right. But I do want to go back and take a look at it sometime yeah. and see how it's. But I think that combination of nature and parts of nature, almost body parts and the, the mm -hmm. hands that are present, like I'm touching, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And then the gold is almost like a veil that you can go through or that radiates back to you. It reminds me of a little Bill Viola's uh, uh, video yes. where they walk yeah. through water and stuff. Let's go to the next one. We'll bring ourselves up to some of the... Uh, this is Maxie's Wall and it's your granddaughter it's named after. That's right. It's 2006. How old was she at this point? Oh, well, I think... Um probably four or five. Um, oh, right. you, see her little, you see the little girl's hands in there. That's why I was wondering, it must be her hands. That is her hands. And I have a picture of her, of which I, can, which I should track down, of her standing in front of it, looking kind of shy. It's kind of wonderful, kind of fun. So, and she, she's actually, um, well, she's 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 wearing a, like a, a gauze kind of dress, and uh, it's quite lovely. I enjoyed it a lot. Seeing her in front of her Maxie's wall, her name is Maximiliana. Oh, wonderful! And I would call her Maxie. So that's it. With this piece also like your changes the, that it has several pieces, and it seems like I mean there there is a a really in arrangement here, but one could play with different arrangements, which could be quite a thrill. Um, yes. Motifs. Let's do one more yes. of these wall type pieces. Next. I should mention, okay, I should have mentioned quickly, but I just want you to know that that piece has a lot of very old lumber in it, the one we just saw, Maxie's wall. This has, I think, mostly new lumber. It's kind of wonderful to work with old beams Oh, and okay. sometimes I find uh, this one. Oh, yeah, Maxie's wall. So you'll see, I don't know if you can tell, but the way the texture works with the carving uh, does uh, kind of echo some of that very old lumber that was used in beams of the loft buildings in Manhattan. And you groove right into the wood for those textures, right? I chisel, I cut right in there into that wood. Um, this is called Dawn Light. It's yeah. 2009, so we're getting up in the 2000s. Now, yeah. you had said this is a transitional piece, and in what way did you think of that? Because we do have a set of later works to show as we round out. Well, this, this work is going more towards white, or more white, and I'm, I'm becoming... Um, much more interested in a series of white works. And so this is part of a group of white works uh, that I started to make uh, because I wanted, I felt there was too much of the gold leaf 
to distract. And I wanted something that would absorb the light and really put people in a position where they just couldn't uh, just um, get too engaged with the gold leaf, that this would mm. sort of put them, I mean, this is what you hope as an artist that these things happen. They don't always, of course, or maybe they do, <clears throat> excuse me, on a level uh, that we're not so conscious of. But uh, this piece has comes out of the wall. I don't know if you can tell from the top. So when you look at it, there's an experience of movement. It's solid and solitary. I mean, it doesn't move, but you get this visual sense of a movement so that it's got space between it. So the ends are flush against the wall and then it has a slight bellow. Um, so right, let's go to the next piece, which brings us to 2019. And we have a, a rich array of, of works that we'll hit on as we round out. Mm -hmm. um, Judy, show this one and then show the next one. Yeah. This, this is Crow and Sandal. Um, it's a series I made 13. I was actually really into it and could have gone on, but I wanted a witchy number. I wanted 13. And uh, this work was about, um, I had a very bad react. Well, I'll just back up a bit. I had a very bad reaction to a medication I was taking. Oh and, and so, and I uh, had to go to the hospital and um, was really in intensive care for several days. And while I was there, I tried to kind of push it a little and see if I could get any images. And these are the images that came out. There was something about the crow flying off. And the sandal is traditionally a sacred thing of the guru in, in the Hindu literature. And so often when you go uh, to a, um, a temple, or to a special shrine, there are sandals left there, which was the guru's sandals. And so I wanted to leave the footsteps and the sandal, the thing that's beautiful is the footsteps are wonderful, but it's even more beautiful to have the actual objects that the guru wore, the teacher wore. And so this is the um, manifestation of that. And these crows are flying around. And there we are. These two pieces are layered because you're using a translucent right. paper mm -hmm. um, and they seem different locations in time and space all in one. And I find that interesting in the, in the crow as a kind of emissary of something is outside of us, but also inside of us. Um, yes. And I, I think, you know, as, Dealing, I won't go into it, but with the thought of what consciousness is and how we access it. Um, let's move on now to this last set of works. The next one is called Mind's Eye. Mm -hmm. It's 2019, and it was the keynote piece. It's very large. What is it, 10 feet? Um, I think it is. I think we measured it. I'm no, and it was on the stage at the Kleinert. Uh, for mm -hmm. the exhibition that I'd curated called Labyrinths of the Mind. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with artists who were exploring now, you know, rather than media and external stuff and political stuff, we're going into their inner life and their inner explorations, both in terms of personal psychology, but a lot of neuroscience and some of it what's being discovered, as well as some dealing with that ineffable depth ground out of which mind uh, emerges and and I would say uh, constellation of these things are here in this piece um, and mm -hmm. it is uh, as you were using uh, finding branches and whole trees um, and then presenting them and you can see the light on it that you get both the physical the corporeal and non-corporeal because you have the right. shadows right the shadows I mean it's, it seems to me so special to have the have that part, those two parts, because the shadows um, change, of course, but they actually um, have so much power uh, as does the solid part. So, the, the ineffable. The interesting thing about this too is that these are the way neurons grow in the brain. 
they grow like the branching of uh, twigs and extension stems on on trees. And I had, in fact, I have a work way in the background here in my house that was on the other end of the wall. Um, let's go to the next one because we'll round out in about three, four minutes here. So we'll hit some of these. Mm -hmm. um, and you see the shadow, how prominent it is here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that is called Young Tree. It's mm -hmm. 2019. And I would say we've got the physical and the ghost mm -hmm. and the red in there. Let's go on another um, in order to really bring out some of the mm -hmm. uh, complicated potential that goes into this. This is called Child's Chair. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this long bow that is connected on one end of the chair and then on this uh, pedestal. Did you... Can you see the chair? I can't see it from my vantage point. Can people see the chair? It's down in the right hand side there. All oh, right, yeah, it's a child's chair. It's like a baby chair, steel baby chair. So in this and then in the next one, uh, you're using the chair. Mm -hmm. oh, good, thanks for the detail. And it seems like the journey from the child's chair to the larger, uh, almost an age projection to the, to the final end there of the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to the high chair next, Judy. All right. That sums up some of the things. Yeah. Uh, Here's there, carved uh, top and bottom seat and floor of the chair uh, with gold leaf and uh, in the panel, and then two feet. And it's been interesting because I carved two of the same feet. Oh, and people, that people point this out to me a lot. And I thought, I can't do that. I can't read it. I have to carve the two, uh, two separate feet, you know, which work together. Didn't work, I couldn't do it. And then a friend of mine who's very involved, who's an artist who's very involved in Hinduism, said, no, that's okay, because there's a, a kind of uh, tale about the same feet, you know, so it didn't have to be a different foot, and I have to really do more research about that. I'm hoping to show this piece in the spring, which is coming up, because it's been postponed from the fall, at AIR Gallery in Dumbo. In uh, supposedly, right. it's supposed to be the end of April to the end of May, but we have to see now. I have to double check the dates. I'm waiting on that information. Yeah, there we have the, the small seat. It's like an elevated child seat at the feet, but they're almost like the feet of the guru. That's right. Uh, in the depth of red. So we have that presence that you come mm -hmm. to in the young tree. Mm -hmm. Let's go two more and we'll round out because of our time. Go to the next one. Sure. Uh, Judy. To the last. Okay, this is Arch, also 2019. Right. And I'm going to end here in terms of the works going, uh, and then we can do some couple questions as we've got, I think, mm -hmm. a minute or so to do. Now go back to the Arch. Yay. Um, what was your emotional connection to this piece? Um, well, I often feel like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, not all the time, certainly, but there. Um, but there is the, this. This is some way that I feel sometimes, and I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, Arch was made well before um, the COVID crisis. So, but it has that quality to me. It's fascinating. Um, and it is really about needing to stretch and mm -hmm. all things, all of the complications which come from stretching. And then it has this cut, you know, and I up in the, the middle of it, I, I find this, the fruits of experience, you know, the needing to open up when opening up takes some real doing. Yeah. Uh, and then red, and then I would end up with this, uh, that the red, you know, I, and it pools down below. It's almost like a kind of visceral 
Mm -hmm. blood red coming to the surface, a kind of life's blood. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean that in any negative sense, but mm -hmm. more in that positive sense of that full life presence. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few more minutes left. Um, and let's see if we have someone wanted to see the first piece again. I'm not sure whether that was the book cover or back to the spirit house of the mother. Okay. Um, so maybe you can post that. Uh, someone else wanted to know where the book could be purchased. Birdcliff yeah. did have them, and maybe uh, maybe they're still available. There, if not, I have some. I can always they always let me know when they've run out, or often have, so I can always bring some more over. And of course, if anybody's interested in having a chat with me, I do have some of the some of the books, and I'm uh, you can get me through my webpage nancyazara.com online. Thank you. There's a question about the birth piece, I think, is that... Time to bring me back. Uh, the piece before the bird piece. Which one was that? Okay. One new message do I get is the piece before the, oh, bird, the bird piece. Bird piece. I'm trying to remember which piece that was. As we're running down. The birth piece was whether that was in the womb or coming out of the womb or where... You know, the location of that birth experience there, that piece. Birth piece. Yeah, that's yeah. the birth piece. That's my daughter's birth. And that was the piece that I found so interesting because it does have a Raul Hay quality to it. And it was, um, my daughter was born in 1967 and that so piece was beautiful. made right around then. So um, it's a big piece of maple that was felled by a hurricane. So that was kind of wonderful. Oh, really? How large is that? It's very large. I can hardly put my oh really you know, my hands around it. All right, uh, Doug. How are we doing? Can we do just one more little question here, or, or should sure. we? Find out? Sure. Go ahead. You can take one or two questions. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Um, if we go to the, I think it was to the doctor's wall, which yeah. would be. Uh, about four past this, Judy, one more. Yeah, keep going there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was the question about whether the, the floor had been done before or after the wall went in. That was about her daughter's piece, or granddaughter. Oh, the granddaughter's piece. Okay, yeah. so we'll yeah, go. This, yeah, this one, one before back. my granddaughter's piece. Oh, no. This no, piece no, will have a floor going, already yeah. in. And it had to be designed with a guardrail because that's what you have to do when you design something for a public space. So the reason why it's broken up is there's a guardrail in two spots so that if they're wheeling a, a wheelchair or if they're wheeling a cart um, and it hits the wall, it hits that instead. It was an interesting challenge. And there was another interesting question here, then going back to the spirit house of the mother. Yes. And that had to do, which is going back. Um, I love getting these very, so there, go one more back there. Whether that red in there is in a sense going into a womb. Oh, I would think that that's probably true. Mm -hmm. um, I have never really articulated it that way, but I think, but come to think of it, I mean, you've got mother of pearl in this, this seed-like quality. Uh, maybe, I don't know, I never counted how many uh, of those kind of seed-like, and the seeds are gone, you know, it's that kind of uh, shell which carried the seeds um, in the back, and that's a beautiful pink mother of pearl. And then the whole wall is on both sides magenta, and it has a beautiful radiance of light, of a kind of beautiful reddish, goldish kind of light. And the floor is also carved spirals that you can just about see from that uh, photograph. So there they are. All right, so I think we can wind up. We okay. see these three layers overlaying, and that is that the teaching is the source of the art, the teaching is a source of the spirit, the teaching uh, and the 
Feminist Art Institute are all interrelated with uh, Nancy's work. So we're grateful to be able to take up so much in one round. And let, me, let, me mention, uh, let me first thank Nancy Azara and Sarah Henry for appearing. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank Judy Kerman, our Zoom operator. Additionally, my thanks goes to our committee members of the Birdcliff Forum and to Carlin Benson, Birdcliff's Director of Exhibitions, and to all of you for joining us. And let me mention also that today's program, like all of the others, becomes part of the Birdcliff YouTube channel. So if you'd like to watch it again, or if you would like to have a friend see it who couldn't see it today, uh, just look at the Birdcliff YouTube channel. Uh, if you would like to help support Birdcliff in its virtual efforts, please visit the Woodclo Woodstock Birdcliff Guild's website and simply use the donate button. So again, thank you all uh, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you too, I loved it. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, I feel the same. It was lovely to have the day with you. And thanks for everyone for the questions. Oh yes, the questions were great. It's really uh, lovely to hear them. Or I would answer that go around that. Okay. All right. Thank you. We talked. Everyone, see you all soon. Here okay. or there. Stay warm. Thank you. Bye bye now. Yes, stay warm for sure. And well. <laughs>